And thank you for again for inviting me to contribute my insights. Um, well, um, before we get an answer to, is it time to start panicking? Let's explore what's going on in this uh, in this uh, space of governance in the face of climate emergencies. And I will tackle the issue using four eyes: insights, intersections, initiatives, and informed actions. And we'll get a glimpse of what's happening in these four domains: insights. So in size, I will, uh, I will limit it to 2019. That was a defining year for the world climate emergency. Many governments around the world, so around 2000 government units in 34 countries declared in their own local or national or regional resolutions that they want to announce climate emergency. And as you see on the screen, some glimpse from um, popular media, BBC, showing how in Scotland, national emergency discourses happening on the, um, in the political lobbies, but as well as on the streets. So there was a sort of a momentum, a stir uh, of, uh, of looking into uh, climate uh, crisis from an emergency lens. But uh, perhaps at the back end, there was no single definition that was uh, available to understand climate emergency for a common citizen, for, a common com for community members, and even for the political lobby. Uh, as um, Professor Andras pointed out, much of the climate discourse has stayed very much focused on energy and emissions. And um, well, a climate emergency does give us a scope to extend that mandate to disasters, as again my colleague from UNVHS pointed out. If we are uh, to agree that this is an emergency, but the climate skepticism has been revolving around the words emergency or urgency, and let's uh, try to understand uh, the context. I mean, if uh, if there was a uh, if there was a small storm in in our city, and uh, we lost some few tiles from our roof, and we want to replace it uh, in one week, or maybe replace it immediately that very day. So that's a little bit of a back end connotation to emergency or urgency. Emergency is immediate action, and urgency is action short in a short period of time, or or planning an action shortly. And um, let's talk about uh, home grounds. The European plan Parliament also declared climate emergency and environmental emergency November 28, 2019, just before the pandemic was uh, making a stir. And, um, and uh, it was the first continent to declare so you know, from a regional perspective, from a sort of many countries involved, many memorandums and referendums uh, taken into account. Uh, the political lobby was divided uh, with around 420 uh, legislative um, experts voting in favor of climate emergency in Europe, 225 against and 19 abstaining. So, uh, um, and uh, in, the, in the light of this um, declaration, the political lobby was split, as we have seen. The communities and people on the other side had various perspectives on climate change and disaster risk. Some, uh, some of course, uh, were in the state of panic, especially if you talk about youth, they were feeling like anxiety or anger. The, the, the others were like uh, in the notion that economic stability of the reason of this region is uh, is maybe translating to climate proofing. So there was a sort of a mixed uh, perspectives in, in the community as such. Climate information has stayed technical and limited to certain stakeholders. That was a big gap. Um, well, uh, you can see on the screen that then uh, Secretary General of the EEB also uh, used a language that talks about uh, uh, an emergency tone, watching uh, the decline of civilization or let's take action. So again, to give you a sort of a narrative coming from the political lobby. The scholarship on the other hand, um, um, the nature communication paper in particular was also pointing to an emergency situation if uh, with the new model uh, modeling uh, and innovative technologies put into climate science, highlighting that one billion of the people are below the um, uh, certain level of coastal um, and uh, sea level um, sort of a landscape dynamics. So I think uh, the what I wanted to point out from here was that 2019 was a defining year in bringing the climate emergency discourse into the political lobbies and to a fair extent into the citizen lobbies, where Oxford Dictionary also declared climate emergency as the word of the year 
noting the massive spike in the use of the term and demonstrating that this term uh, is you know, pointing to the great immediacy in the conversations we are having about climate change. So, uh, and in the parallel, there were, uh, in the same time, in 2019, there was a sort of uh, people who were advocating for climate protection, climate adaptation mitigation measures to be fast-tracked, were organizing themselves to create a climate fund. So all this is 2019, that movements are waking up to public and the public and the uh, public force was also kind of uh, joining the conversation to organize transformative policy change. Uh, uh, well, why this, uh, why this all started in 2019, uh, partly because of this report from IPCC that uh, uh, was then flagged in the media uh, with the title, Final Call to Save the World from Climate Catastrophe. And this uh, report, that uh, mainly talks about uh, the scenario, 1.5 uh, degree scenario, um, and also kind of gives us a, a sort of, a, a, I would say, a perspective on uh, big, uh, big systems that we have to look into, energy, land use, cities, and industries. But it's what also urging people uh, on actions that they can, uh, they can foster at the local scale, with by whether it was linked to buying less meat or locally seasoned food or driving electric cars and trains and buses using instead of planes using uh, ICT media video conferencing and um, and as some other actions which was also maybe tying to the tying to the um, response that an individual or community people can can uh, take to contribute to the climate discourse so i think this report created a momentum uh, wherein climate emergency was featured as a response both by the political lobby but also by the uh, by the community and uh, advocacy groups um this was uh, more on the european uh, side of response but let's take what uh, let's uh, uh, quickly see what uh, the Asia climate emergency discourse was shaping again in um, post-2019 and after uh, some of these developing um, regions had already declared climate emergency in their municipality or cities. Well, uh, the Asia climate emergency discourse, uh, which was facilitated by the International Monetary Fund, was taking a stock of the increase in disaster frequency and intensity and making a case for green finance and so that more money can flow into climate resilient investments. Similarly, in Africa, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program um, was uh, taking the climate emergency discourse to invest into smart digital technologies, resilient infrastructure, empowering youth and innovating financial initiatives for Africa. So, what I wanted to give you is an insight of how different geographical regions were taking note of climate emergency discourse to frame their strategy for climate resilient future. Um, so this uh, this was um, the first two parts on um, on uh, so this is the second part of intersections. I'm sorry about this is not part three but part two. In terms of intersections, the climate uh, emergency discourse both in its academic framing uh, through scientific publications was pointing to the need of interconnected dimensions in climate uh, science and in, in designing climate services and climate response decisions. Food, energy, population and pollution were in the center um, of, uh, of, of the discourse on interconnected uh, risk and interconnected response systems. Sustainable Development Goal was again uh, a good um, guiding document, if I if I can say, to bring together all these interconnected issues. While climate change has a standalone position as SDG 13 in this whole portfolio or umbrella of sustainability targets and goals, uh, climate change was also directly and indirectly linked uh, to several other goals and targets. And climate emergency, as you see by UN DESA on uh, Department of Economics and uh, Social Affairs uh, was also making a case on highlighting the interconnectedness of different uh, agendas to food, energy, 
um, energy industry consumption and other provisional needs of the society by 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 facilitating statistics um, data information and knowledge systems as you see in the screen in one of the infographs that came along with this um, with this interconnected report um, and then uh, the overarching uh, sustainable development goals on strengthening institutions was directly talking to the governance gaps and needs, um, including that in the climate change domain. Sustainable development 17, of course, was making a lot of sense to understand best management practices to facilitate exchange and cooperation so that these solutions can be co-created these solutions can be exchanged between global north and global south and also between um, and across regions and countries. Water security, now talking from a sectoral perspective, water security framework by United Nations was another such guiding framework, talking to the water management sector, which is in the heart of the climate change uh, discourse, both from um, mainly from adaptation, but also kind of from a disasters um, viewpoint who had uh, clearly in, uh, integrated water related disasters and climate change as part of the agenda for water governance. So again, I'm, I'm kind, kind of giving an insight on interconnection, interdependencies um, and intersectionality. And uh, this report uh, on um, sustainable engineering in action was again facilitated by UN on its 75th anniversary to ensure that engineering interventions are also designed and implemented with, um, with uh, in, in, a, in a collective manner, and not just for, uh, from a technology lens, but from also taking note of how uh, how, if we require solutions that are more hybrid, that take about, that also uh, incorporate or embed the need of ecological systems and of that of nature. And the uh, UN Water Development Reports for per se has been uh, doing a, a fantastic job in putting together a narrative case studies and best management practices on, on kind of describing these intersections uh, and um, interconnectedness but also kind of the latest uh, report of 2020 talks particularly about making a case, uh, a joint case for water management, water governance and climate governance. Mm. Uh, in part three, I would like to share an initiative that uh, three of our United Nations university agencies have put together in response to the European philosophy of 2021 that resulted in more than 200 fatalities or damage, uh, widespread damage of more than 30 billion euros. The links to climate change was made evident by policymakers, by media. Uh, and um, um, if you link it to international governance uh, reports on climate change, uh, IPCC for that region talks about this, that this extreme will likely become the new normal in this uh, projections and simulations. So uh, in the response, uh, in response to this and making this as a central case study, uh, we have launched a new initiative last year in August, and this was formally launched by in a high level event in February of 2022. And in this uh, initiative, we, we talk about interconnected risks and impacts. Uh, my colleague Zita is also a part of this um, initiative. We also talk about innovation, adaptation and transformation, both in terms of needs and gaps. And uh, in particular, we want to emphasize that uh, uh, regional integration and cross-border collaboration remains crucial, especially in the case where um, such disaster events are across territorial uh, boundaries. And just to glimpse, uh, get you a glimpse of different work packages, uh, we also have focus attention on individual and community preparedness and response systems. So, uh, uh, so just to kind of simplify, how do we amplify the response mechanisms? How do we ensure that communities are well prepared to be an active stakeholder in such response systems? And I'll give you a quick insight of what we've been doing in that direction. Uh, one of our key domain of uh, priority is a focus on uh, mental health in climate services because climate grief is becoming something that uh, citizens and populations are witnessing as a result of disaster events and uh, the loss 
of um, assets, loss of lives that is, uh, that is noted uh, around these disaster events. A recent study revealed that 80% of 10,000 young people in 10 different countries reported that they are very worried about climate change and disasters with emotions expressed as sad, afraid, anxious, and also angry. And so I think uh, this was uh, this is one of our core mandates to understand that mental health features in adaptation and resilience planning, and we can support different populations uh, in terms of age cohorts, ethnic groups, and gender groups in different geographies and impacted communities, and to build a psychosocial resilience as a part of climate solution. And um, we'll be talking more about this in our flash. Flood Knowledge uh, Summit in July of 2022, and we'll be happy to share more information. So some of you with us today can also participate and share your research, your insights, and join us this summer. Part four, four and I'm concluding in next two slides, is um, informed decisions and evidence-backed uh, decision-making. So uh, yes, uh, the scientists are doing their job. The policies make the policy um, uh, lobby is trying to steer some momentum in high-level meetings like COPs. The United Nations agencies is trying to do uh, a kind of um, trying to steer this um, discourse by putting the facts together. And uh, if you see on the screen the. Um, um, the, the small facts uh, make a big difference. I mean, uh, if you see that, uh, why, is one, why was 1.5 degree um, Celsius important? And uh, we may have passed this future, uh, future but a difference between 1.5 to 2 degree could lead 6 or 16 million affected by sea level rise. So I think just to give you a sort of a numerical count on how different scenarios will pan out in different uh, situations. And uh, well, we have... Uh, a superpower in diagnostics of climate science. We are also, uh, as humanity, as scientific communities, as citizens, also attracted to understanding solutions. So the world is all not that grim. If we have problems, we also have uh, the zeal to understand solutions, to apply them and to adopt them, to scale them at uh, our context. And nature-based solutions is one such uh, paradigm that has picked up um, significantly in the climate discourse, a solution for infrastructural needs, a solution for um, climate needs, and solution for smart investments. In the context of time, I'm just sharing the term, but I'm very happy to, to elaborate if uh, the discussion time allows later. And uh, as a UNU agency, we have also put together uh, different case studies and different publications on how best management practices in NBS is implemented around the world by communities through a, through a collective mechanism, through collaborative and consensus building between communities, policymakers, and scientists. So uh, uh, again, to give you a glimpse, again, there are other uh, concepts uh, floating around which do bear merit and potential for scaling climate services, for understanding both energy and material goals that we need to put in tandem to have more climate resilient futures. Circular economy and circularity is again one such paradigm. And uh, the World Business Council, for example, is also building coalitions uh, with private sector act uh, actors and agencies who are of course, uh, have not been active in the past, but now are becoming a, a, a central stakeholder in the climate discourse. So uh, again, talking about the private sector to be on the table. And of course, the UN is also steering uh, the support to climate discourse uh, through other commitments like the UN decade on ecosystem restoration so that the nature needs and human needs can be balanced in tandem. And uh, many countries have adopted um, some of these um, guidelines to develop their own local strategy. And I'll quote two countries on the screen, Australia, to understand, uh, to have a documentation, a guideline documentation for their municipalities, for their communities to, uh, how do you kind of act uh, in an emergency mode, in a normal mode, like climate urgency? or in an emergency mode, climate emergency. So I, I sort of making that distinction, so there is no panic, but at least there is so, a sort of a collaboration, a spirit to act together if there is a need. And uh, for example, it talks about uh, in an emergency mode, if the situation demands the society have to engage productively 
in mitigating their crisis, but not in a panic mode. And uh, in, in case of uh, the UK, uh, they have also organized toolkits at the city level, taking account of contextual and uh, situations that apply to a particular municipality or a city. So very localized solutions to, uh, to ensure that uh, people don't panic and hope is retained, gaps are filled and needs are assessed. And uh, my closing point, is a time to panic? No, perhaps. Perhaps it's time to start acting together. Governance in the face of climate emergencies needs concentrated effort, collaborations, consultative actions, and integrated agendas. And as humanity, we have acknowledged and reckoned uh, that need. It's not an easy task for sure. Transformation will require facilitation at multiple levels. And in co context of that, I can uh, say that as a UN agency, as UN Chris, we are at least um, deconstructing a critical mechanism to facilitate that on multi-level governance. That gives us um, a perspective um, guideline to, to um, facilitate collaborations across different scales and sc uh, sectors and stakeholders and institutions to understand how we can co-create collective solutions for risk reduction and climate resilience societies and populations. Thank you and all.